Welcome to Electron Line and now to the supernova that was seen in 1987, called the 1987A supernova. Now, that was very lucky for us because back in 1987, in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is one of the neighboring galaxies to our galaxy, 168,000 light years away, a supernova occurred on February 23rd of that year. Now, prior to that, the last supernova that we had uh, that we had seen, or at least recorded using telescopes, was back in the 17th century, way back in our own galaxy. And so since then, all the supernovas that we've, uh, that we've observed throughout the, uh, throughout the universe had been observed in other galaxies millions of light years away. And so there was not a lot that we knew about them. We did study the light curves and so forth, which we'll get into in just a little while. But we have never had the opportunity to study a supernova that occurred very close. And of course, 168,000 light years for supernovas is very close. Hopefully in the near future, one may go off in our own galaxy even closer to us than that so we can have a better idea of what these things are. But it was really amazing when we started observing that. When it was first seen on that morning, of course, news went around the world saying, hey, there's a supernova going off and in the Large Magellanic Cloud, and everybody took their telescopes and trained their telescopes toward it. And what was interesting was, when they started observing the event, and of course it's an event that takes a number of days, it gets bright, the supernova gets bright over a period of several days, reaches the maximum brightness, and then begins to fade over the next several weeks, and then it begins to fade away from visibility over the next so many months. But what was interesting was, when they realized that the supernova went off that close, back uh, in the two very famous detectors, the Kamiokande detector in Japan and the IMB detector in Michigan, recorded a burst of neutrinos about three hours prior to when the visible light started to started be seen using telescopes. So there was a three hour difference between when we received a burst of neutrinos, presumably from the uh, supernova in the Large Magellanic Cloud, and from the visible light that hit us about three hours later. And what was amazing about it is the number of neutrinos that were detected. In the Kamiokande detector, 11 neutrinos were detected in a 10 second period. And in the IMB detector, about 8 neutrinos were detected. Now you may say, wow, 11, 8, what's the big deal? But it turns out that only a very tiny percentage of all the neutrinos that go through the detector are actually detected. And so when we calculated back, what that must have meant is that we had about a detection of 10 to the 16 neutrinos that must have gone through those detectors in that 10 second period. Now, imagine that neutrinos leave a place 168,000 light years away, they go into all directions of the universe, and then a very small percentage of that actual reach those detectors on the Earth, 168,000 light years away, and that many neutrinos would have then gone through those detectors. And those detectors are about the size of maybe, oh, how big are they? Uh, they're probably the size of a medium-sized building, and they're filled with a special fluid and chemical so that they will detect specific interactions between the neutrinos and the radioactive elements within the, within the fluid in those detectors. And that enables us to see a very small percentage of the neutrinos coming through. Basically, neutrinos are particles that have very little mass, have no charge, and go through just about everything without any interruption. For example, neutrinos are going through your bodies right now that com are coming from the sun, and that's what those detectors are made for. Uh, made uh, for it is to measure the neutrinos coming from the sun and also they go right through the earth as if the earth isn't there and very small percentage of acts will interact with any matter whatsoever so it's amazing that we're able to detect neutrinos in those detectors so then calculating back realizing how this burst of neutrinos would have spread all over the universe and how a very small percentage of that would have then actually reached the earth and reached those detectors we went back and calculated what that would have meant and so the estimation was that about 10 to the 58 neutrinos would have been expelled from that supernova ex explosion in a 10 second period. 10 to the 58 neutrinos, that's an enormous quantity of neutrinos. What that means was, and if we then calculate the speed at which they travel, the mass that they have, and we then calculate how many of them would have left that supernova explosion, the energy released in that 10 second burst was 10 to the 46 joules. Wow, that's an enormous amount of energy because what that means is 10 to 46 joules is about 100 times the energy released by the sun in its entire lifetime. Can you imagine the sun shining for 5 billion years and then 
the energy released in that 10 second burst was at least 100 times as much as the energy released by the sun in its entire lifetime. That is an incredible amount of energy to simply burst forward in the form of neutrinos being ejected. On top of that, these, these supernova explosions are extremely bright and that means that 10 to the 40, 46 joules was at least 100 times the amount of energy released from the explosion as compared to the visible light energy that was expelled by the explosion. So there was a three hour difference between the, the uh, onset of the light coming from the explosion and the neutrinos being released. And that first burst of neutrinos carried just about all of the energy from the supernova explosion. An incredible, incredible amount of energy. And so having a supernova uh, go off that close to home basically gave us a tremendous insight in the amount of energy released in that explosion, gave us the visibility into that that we did not have before. So that gives us another perspective of what supernovas are, just an enormous amount of energy released from these enormous explosions, and basically they're star explosions, we'll get more into details of that. And so what we want to do now is learn a little bit more about what is going on during the explosion and so from observations we have made what we call light curves so in the next video we're going to talk about the light curves of supernovas and from that we're going to realize there's different types of supernovas and so if you're still interested stay tuned let's talk about light curves of supernovas in the next video